so good to be with you guys. It's so good already. It's just good to be in the room with people going after God. It's uh, uh, good to be here in New Zealand. Good to see all the international friends as well. Uh, uh, this is the last time I was here, I was with Equippers in uh, 2016, and it's good to be back. Um, I, I, listen, I know that New Zealand's famous for a lot of things. you got a rugby team or whatever else, but... Um, <laughs> I think maybe the greatest thing in New Zealand is those pineapple lumps. Candy? I, uh, whatever else comes out of New Zealand, God bless New Zealand. I, are those New Zealand candies or are they from, because so, God bless them. I, uh, uh, so yes, I come all the way to New Zealand for those. That's just those and then I go home with those. So man, it's so good to be here. Um, I want to pray over just, uh, I just feel some things in the room before we jump in the word today. But um, but uh, he mentioned uh, I'm banning. Uh, just give you a little, uh, give you a little context. We're going to be spending a few days together. Uh, but I uh, born and raised in Redding, California, uh, uh, where where Bethel is. I'm born and raised there. In fact, when the offering came up, I was about to start chanting USA during the offering. I was hoping an American flag was about to be on the LED wall. Um, but I was born and raised in uh, uh, Redding, California, and uh, came on staff there at Bethel when I was 19. Uh, just a few months before uh, Bill came and. Uh, uh, Bill Johnson came when I was 19, and I took him under my wing and began to mentor him. <laughs> I took Bill under my wing and just began to mentor him, and just so proud of all that God's done in his life, and just really just the things that God's done. And after 18 years of mentoring Bill, uh, uh, G's culture had kind of grown out of what we were doing there, and, and about nine years ago, we went to Sacramento and uh, planted a church eight years ago. And it's uh, just been such a joy and a privilege to be able to do that, plant a church in San Diego. And uh, married, been married for, it'll be 25 years in just a couple months. And I uh, have 23-year-old, 20-year-old, 17-year-old, so just right, right in the midst of all of that type of stuff. I, um, uh, tonight during worship, uh, and Sam, I don't, I don't, I'll just, just release this over the, when I was, um, uh, you, you guys may not know, I, I know that many of you would know the Jesus Culture worship, but, but Jesus Culture was a youth conference that we started years ago. It was just a youth conference. We were just going after God with these teenagers, and then we kind of started taking the youth conference out, and, and a lot of the, uh, the worship leaders were just our worship leaders at youth group. Uh, uh, I don't know if you guys would know Kim and Chris, but Chris Kilala was, he's 39 now. He was 12 when I started youth ministry. Uh, he was in my wedding when he was 14. He's still with us today. He's 39 and still with us, and, but he was 14. He practically lived in my house during high school. The amount of video games I played with that kid. And... Um, but anyways, um, Jesus culture was just, just beginning to take off, and we were starting to do these youth conferences. And I, I want to just share this. that there was a, We were doing a youth conference at one time in Reading, and there was, we were at our kind of civic center, and there was maybe, I don't know, a little over 2,000 of these teenagers in this room. And it was just this really incredible moment of, like, just consecration unto God and, you know, just the whole place, front, the, the whole room engaged, just singing hallelujah. And it was this powerful moment. And I was off to the side of the stage, and I was just, uh, uh, I was just on my face before the Lord. I was like on my, uh, uh, on my, just on my knees, kind of just on my face before the Lord. And and there was a moment that kind of was a defining moment for us, where the Lord came to me, and he he just he just asked me this. He said, "Benny, if you'll ask me for a generation in America, I'll give you one." And I just remember being on that side stage. I don't even know how I was 26, 27. I, and, I, and I, I just remember saying, I just remember saying, God, would you give me a generation in America? He asked me that. He just said, if you'll ask me for a generation in America, I'll give you one. I just said, God, would you ask me for a generation in America? And then I, I, I actually don't share this much, cause, but, but there was, a, when I asked him that, I was like, I was on my hands and knees. I felt him come and put a mantle on me, and I knew it was a mantle to mobilize I knew as a mantle to mobilize and to take what was happening in that room with just a, a couple thousand teenagers and see it impact a generation. And man, I was in here tonight during worship, I, I, and I, I feel it's for the Acts movement. I, I feel like maybe it's for a handful of people in here. I, I don't know, but I, I just I felt the Lord on stage saying the same thing tonight. To whoever will hear this and whoever will grab all hold of this, I feel like the Lord's asking the same thing. And I'm not talking about a generation of teenagers. I'm talking about a generation that's alive. Uh, we, our, our generation is zero to 100. If you're breathing, you're part of that generation, you know. 
And, uh, and, and I just felt the Lord in the room tonight. And I, I don't know if this is an invitation for the Acts movement. I don't know if this is an invitation for uh, people in this room. But, I, but I, I know it's an invitation for people in the room. But I'm saying that I, I just felt the Lord just saying, if you'll ask me for a generation in your nation, I'll give it to you. And I felt the Lord, I, I felt the Lord putting some, some radical prayers in your heart. And I just saw the Lord beginning to put faith inside of people to actually mobilize, to mobilize a generation in your nation. I, I, I mean, I saw coming out of this place, people that began to believe God for stadiums to be filled with people seeking the Lord. And that, and that the Lord was going to begin in this, in this time just to begin to say, will, will you believe? If you'll believe, I will give it to you if you'll ask me for it. And I just saw some like, well, well we're so young, right? I just like, I, I'm like, Lord, this is what I want. But just that, just that childlike faith that says, God, I'm asking for a generation. Would you give me a generation? And would you anoint us to mobilize the body of Christ for revival in our nation? That we would see stadiums filled with signs and wonders. That we'd see stadiums filled with those seeking. I just want to pray this over this movement. Lord, even on the first night, we just pray this. Lord, I, I believe that you're going to begin to stir hearts to believe you, not just for good church. I can tell you this, that there's a, um, the story of uh, uh, Hannah so fascinating. The story of Hannah is so fascinating because Hannah is this prophetic picture of I really, what I believe we're supposed to be in that Hannah had this cry in her heart for a son, but she wasn't just going to give birth to a son. She was going to give birth to a prophet. And she wasn't just going to give birth to a prophet. She was going to give birth to Samuel, who was the prophet that prepared the way for King David in the Davidic kingdom. So Hannah becomes this type and picture of the body of Christ that's called to give birth to prophetic moves that prepare the way for the messianic kingdom to come. And, 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 but, but God actually had closed her womb, not because he didn't want to release something through her, but because he had to get her to a place where her cry, her desperation before the Lord. And so the Lord had closed her womb, and I don't want to preach this story, but, but, but there was something where all of a sudden, and, and there was, there's a point in the story where, where you see Hannah having to decide if she's going to be satisfied with anything less than a son. Her husband's confused by her. Her husband comes to her and just says, I, why are you so sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Why are you so sad? Like, I, I give you more. I do all this type of stuff. And for one verse, Hannah kind of tries to be all right. And then the next verse, she's back on her face crying out to God saying, God, I want a son. Would you give me a son? And, and I, I think that, that we, we have to actually get to a point where we have to decide, I don't just want good church. I, I'm grateful for good church. Don't get me wrong. I'm grateful for good church. I'm grateful for a husband that's good to me. But God has put a cry in my heart that I want to see a move of God in our day that impacts nations. And I'm not going to be satisfied with just good church. I'm not just going to be satisfied with things that are good. I, and and I, this is my prayer. I'm actually, I'm praying that God would just ruin you for everything else. I'm praying that God would put something inside of you, a cry in your heart that says, God, I, I listen, I'm so grateful for what's, I'm so grateful for the good, but God, I want revival. I want to see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in my city. I want to see an entire city saved. I want to see an entire city transformed. I want to see a harvest come in. It's unprecedented. Like, but this thing gets in you. It's a cry that gets in there. It's a cry that had to get in Hannah. To where she was before the Lord and just crying out and Hannah and, and Eli comes. And, and so, Lord, I just pray that. God, I just pray in this room right now, even as we start this thing out. God, I pray that one of the things you're going to do is you're going to begin to stir in the hearts of people a cry, not just for good church, but a cry for revival. A cry that says, God, we want to see prophetic moves. We want to see moves of God that usher in the kingdom of your son. 
Lord, I pray that you begin to wreck people. I pray that you begin to ruin them for anything else. God, that we wouldn't be so easily satisfied. And then, God, I just pray just for this Acts movement. Father, I believe that you're putting an anointing on them to mobilize. God, that you're putting an anointing on them. You're putting faith in them, not just to believe for churches, but to believe for nations that are mobilized into the gospel. God, I pray you'd release resources and faith, but more than anything else, you'd release a cry in their heart for this thing. And God, we stand here tonight and we ask for that. God, would you give us a generation? God, that we would be bold enough, that we'd be audacious enough, that we would come to you and say, God, give us a generation in our time and in our day that you would awaken a generation with your power and your love. Amen? Amen. All right, well, it's good to be here. <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I want to. I'm going to take. A, I've, I've got a few sessions with you guys, and I really do. Really count it just an absolute honor. Uh, I can't think of anywhere that I'd want to be than in a room with leaders uh, that are going the same direction, passionate about the same thing. And, and, I, and my prayer is that God would just come and meet with you in a significant way. That He would come and speak with you. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to First Corinthians chapter nine. First Corinthians chapter nine. I'm going to read just a quick verse. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but you can if you want. It'll be quick. But First Corinthians chapter nine. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, and he says this. He says, "Therefore, I do not run like someone rain, running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air." I'm going to read this again. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. When Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't say this. He doesn't say, I'm not running. He doesn't say, I'm running, po- uh, unlike those who aren't running. He says, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm boxing, unlike those who are not boxing. What he says is this. He says, I'm not running aimlessly, and I'm not boxing and not hitting anything. I I am sober about getting to the end of my life and looking back. I often think of the end of my life when I'm sitting on a porch somewhere, drinking a cup of coffee, overlooking a field with horses. It's going to be the end of my life. And, uh, and, I, and, and, I, and I look back and think, I spent my life on things that didn't really matter. My concern right now is this. My concern is not a lack of activity. Paul was not addressing a lack of activity. Paul was not addressing people that weren't running. Paul wasn't addressing people that weren't uh, boxing. He was addressing people that were running aimlessly and people that weren't hitting the mark. The concern right now for me is this. It's not a lack of activity. At the end of my life, what I'm concerned about is I don't want to look back and say there was much activity, but it never went anywhere and it never hit a mark. That my life was full of activity. My life in ministry was busy. There were things happening but I didn't actually cross a finish line, and I didn't actually hit the mark. This is a concern for me. And one of the reasons why Paul was able to say this, that that I'm not running aimlessly and I'm hitting the mark, is because he was able to properly define success. One of the things that I believe we need to wrestle through in the body of Christ right now is actually defining success. We have been influenced by a worldly definition of success more than we can imagine. And the kingdom has not influenced us at the level I believe it's supposed to when it comes to defining success. Can we actually define success? And I believe that we have to answer these two questions. That every leader in the body of Christ needs to be, be, needs to be able to answer these two questions. One, what does success look like for the people of God? I'm going to talk about this tomorrow morning, but what does success look like for the people of God? I'll give you the punchline right now. It's this, the presence of God. That flat out, I don't, however else you want to measure it, success for the people of God looks like the presence of God. But then we also should be able to answer this question. What does success look like for the child of God? 
See, if I can't determine what success is, if I don't know what success is in the kingdom, then how do I know if I'm actually hitting the mark? If I haven't actually clearly defined what the bullseye is, then how do I know if I'm even hitting it? If I haven't actually determined and clarified in my own heart, this is what the finish line looks like. This is what success looks like in the kingdom. Then how do I know if I'm running aimlessly or not running aimlessly? How do I know if I'm just, and this is, listen, you may have a lot of activity. It doesn't mean that you're actually running the right direction. So, so as, as leaders in the body of Christ, we have, to be able to, we have to be able to define this. What does success look like for the people of God? What does success look like for the children of God? For the child of God? And ultimately, I want to tell you this. The kingdom success can only be determined through the lens of eternity. I, I, I know that we applaud this, but... But I, I want to challenge you tonight around this thing. That kingdom success can only be determined through the lens of eternity. See, the mandate on our life is to bear fruit. But it's not just to bear fruit. John 15 makes this very clear. That we're to bear fruit, we're to bear a lot of fruit. But we're to bear fruit that remains. Fruit that lasts. So Jesus says, this is the mandate on your life. It's to bear fruit, but not just fruit. It's to bear fruit that remains, fruit that lasts. See, we, we, we are trying to constantly um, determine success based on short term. And we don't even know it sometimes. We position our ministries, we position what we're building to build for the short term, not the long term. When I work with youth pastors, I was in youth ministry for uh, over a decade, and, and when I, and I'm, pro I'm, 15, uh, I'm 15 years removed from youth ministry, I'm probably 20 years removed from being in the middle of it at, at a deeper level. And, and when, I, when I work with youth pastors now, one of the things I try to get them to is this. I try to say, listen, you need to focus on now what you're going to talk about in 20 years. Like, this is the goal. Can you focus now on what you're going to be talking about in 20 years. Because you can't actually determine success apart from that. So when I look back now 20 years ago as a youth pastor, I think, you know, the things that made me happy and the things that made me sad, they, uh, I, you, know, I, I, you know, I was happy when my sermon went well, I was happy when the, we pulled off a skit, I was happy whenever the retreat went good, I was happy when there were a lot of kids there. But now 20 years later, it doesn't make me happy or sad. Like, that nobody's even talked to me. Like, I've never even talked about it. Nobody goes, hey, Ben, in August 2001. <laughs> how good was your sermon that night? Huh? How good was it? I'm like, it was so good. <laughs> well, you know, like, it doesn't, I don't, we don't talk about it. You know what we talk about? The kids still love Jesus. And, and some of them are still in my church. <laughs> but, but, and they still call me youth pastor. They still drive down, and they're in their mid-30s, they're in their late 30s, they got kids, they're married, they love Jesus, they're plugged into their church, they're changing their city. Like, that's what makes me happy. And you know what makes me sad? The ones that aren't. Joshua has completely gone away from God. Amanda, Mad, uh, Manny. Like those, the, the ones that aren't, and the ones that are, the, the ones that make me happy are Chris and Natalie and Holly and Gabe. Like, like the ones that are following Jesus 20 years later, oh, that's what makes me happy. And the ones that aren't makes me sad. What I was happy and sad about then. And so, so we have to be able to say, okay, well, how do I, I cannot, listen, we are called to bear not just fruit. We're called to bear fruit that remains. And so it means that I have to begin to say, all right, I need to focus on now what I'm going to be talking about in 20 years. Because you can't actually determine success. I want to talk about eternity. You cannot determine success by, by not even looking 20 years down the road. Guys, we are constantly trying to wrap our head around and put some type of metrics on success. They're going to say for this gathering. This, 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 they're they're going to, at the end of the gathering, they'll, you know, they'll come to Sam and say, Sam, how's the gathering? And, and he's going to try to put some metrics around this. Like, hey, man, we had this many people come. And, man, worship was great. And, I mean, the preacher was unbelievable. And, and, 
and, and, you know, and, and, and this many people, and I heard some good stuff. But do you know what the, you know what the real answer is? How'd the conference go? I don't know. I'll let you know in 20 years. I actually, I actually don't know. If this conference is bearing fruit in 20 years, what a great conference. If it's like, can, can I, for everybody that's preaching, can I just put, take some pressure off you? Because you, when you, this, this is amazing for me with preachers right now. They're going to say, Benny, how'd, you, how'd your word go? How'd it go tonight? You know, my wife might ask me, how'd it go tonight? I'm going to try to give like, hey, you know, I felt it was good and had a little prophetic word at the beginning. And I felt like my stories, they landed funny and felt like I, you know, preached scripture all right, you know. But do you know the honest, when people ask you, how'd your sermon go? I don't know. I'll let you know in 20 years. Like, I don't know how it went. This is the honest truth. I'm not, this is the honest truth. Because if this message tonight is still bearing fruit in 20 years, what a phenomenal message. If it's not bearing fruit in 20 years, it sucked. Are you with me on this? And we have got to get out of this thing that somehow we are constantly looking for like metrics. Like, how do we measure success? How, how, is it successful? Is it not successful? And I'm like, I don't know. Let's see if it bears fruit long term. That's how we're going to measure that thing. You can't determine your success as a parent in the middle of teenage years. <laughs> Are you with me on this? See, the, the Bible the Bible's clear about, the, the Bible points us to a few things. One of them is this. The Bible says that this life is short. This life is short. Whether it's 70 years, whether it's 90 years, 70 years compared to 70 billion times 70 billion years. This life is short. The Bible describes it as a moment, a, 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 a breath, a vapor, grass that grows and withers. So not only is this life short, but the Bible also makes this clear, that one day you'll stand before God. You won't have to give an account for your sins because you have been washed clean by the blood of the land and the Father sees you as righteous because of the work of his Son. But you will have to give an account for your life. And so, so what I try to constantly do is this, because if we can't determine success apart from eternity, and trust me on this, you can't. If we can't determine, if we can't determine success outside of 20 years, let alone eternity, and so, so what, the questions we should be asking ourselves, when I try to ask myself regularly, is this. One, is this going with me into eternity? Two, will Jesus even ask me about this? How else can I determine if I'm hitting the mark, if I'm crossing the finish line, if I'm running after stuff that Jesus won't even ask me about? We... <laughs> You'll have, to, you'll have to filter out some of the American, uh, what, what we deal with in America. But, but, you know, whether it's numbers on a Sunday, maybe I'm stressed about that. Do you, do you know that when I get to heaven, Jesus is not going to ask me about that? He's not going to go, Banning, listen, uh, Wednesday, it was Sunday, Sunday in August of 2022. Uh, Man, how many people do you have at your church? <laughs> well, I mean, God, we just went through COVID. We're in California. I, I, you know, I, yeah. it's, just, it's not going to happen. Here's, I'm just, let me get straight to my point today. Here's how you define success in the kingdom. Faithfulness and obedience. That's it. Even love, which we're called to do. I want you to love well. Love is still connected to obedience. The more that I love Jesus, he tells me to love him, so I love him. And when I love him, he comes to me and says, hey, listen, we, go love people now, too. But, but faithfulness and obedience. See, one day we're going to stand before God, and what we want to hear come out of his mouth is, well done, good and faithful servant. See, when I stand before him one day, I had a, um, he's going to ask me, did you do what I asked you to do, and were you faithful with what I gave you. Were you faithful with what I gave you and did you do what I asked you to do? See, we, we have bought into a worldly version of success and, and perhaps I'm only speaking to Americans, so 
uh, 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 wherever the American New Zealander was. But, but, but we've bought into this worldly version of success that, that, su that success is somehow connected to, to numbers or it's somehow connected to a list or it's somehow connected to uh, fame or it's somehow connected to likes. It's connected to something other than faithfulness and obedience. I, I, um, I wrote a book, which I can't just say it in here. It's going to be horrible. I'm not even going to bring it up right now. But I wrote a, a good book, and it's a cuss word in Austra Australia and New Zealand or whatever else. Um, but I wrote a follow-up book to it <laughs> called The Three Mile Walk. And if you've ever, if, I don't know if anybody's written a book, but writing a book is like a really vulnerable kind of experience, way more than preaching. Like preaching, they're like, you know, they like you or not. I'm like, I don't know. I think they did. Book, it's obvious. They're buying it or not buying it. You know, it's, it's just, and, and writing a book is this, like you put, it's, you know, it's, it's 15 years of a life message in a book, not like a sermon you put together in a weekend type deal. And so you, ha you write this book, you put it out there, but then you're t it's, you feel vulnerable. And it's like having a kid that you don't think is cute, but you really, really need people not to say that the baby's ugly. You know, I'm not convinced this baby's cute. Please don't tell me the baby's ugly. It's going to crush me. <laughs> so, and then when you write a book, when you write a book, it's pretty anticlimactic because you push hard, you get, it to the, you get it to the publisher, and then they're like, all right, we're going to release it in nine months. So, so I wrote this book. And uh, I was excited about it, believing the message, three-mile walk, and all this stuff. And so I turned it into 2019, fall of 2019. They said, great, we're going to get it out. We'll release it in June of 2020. So, so, you know, we get all ready, and you start working on, you know, marketing stuff and social media plans and all that stuff. And then the pandemic hits, but we're like, yeah, that's all right. You know, the pandemic will be over soon, and then that didn't happen. But, but then you kind of get but we're like, you know what, it's okay. Summertime. And in America, and, and, and listen, this will be good, man. People need courage, and they need the message of this book. So we're, get, we're about a week away from the release date in June. And, and, and America, cities were literally on fire from what happened with George Floyd. I mean, it was, I, it was just, I mean, it, the, the, uh, civil unrest, cities on fire, People in my congregation hurting, and and we just realized like I like our book. This book's coming out, but I'm not I'm not sure we should even be talking about this book right now. Like this this isn't the right time to talk about it. And then we come my release date. My release date was June second, which I don't know if you remember this, but it was Blackout Tuesday. Did you have Blackout Tuesday out here? Blackout Tuesday, where all of social media. Just went black for a day. That was the day my book released. You have a whole plan. We're going to roll out a whole plan. And we finally said, I said, guys, we can't roll anything out. Everything we've talked, we can't do it. Not even because it's tone deaf, because it's just not what we're supposed to be doing right now. And so we kind of, we don't even mention the book. Like a week after it gets released, I'm kind of like, hey, there's, there's a book that I did. And it was just this whole thing. And I don't even know what happened in the book. I haven't even looked. I don't, I don't even look. At, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what it did. But it just didn't do well at all. And, and here's what you have to begin to recognize. When I stand before God one day, how do I determine what success in this, in this moment? Not just the world, but the church world would want to tell you that it has to do with some list. It would have to do with how many books you sold. It would have to do with whatever. The kingdom doesn't even think like that at all. I'm going to stand before God one day, and you know what he's not going to ask me? Hey, Benny, how many books you sell? Three mile walk. I mean, God, it was like Blackout Tuesday, man. Like I, could do, like, I just, you know, and he's like, well, you know who didn't have a problem? Joel Osteen. <laughs> Joel Osteen seemed to sell a lot of books still. Joel, get on in there, buddy. Get on in there. You stay right there, Benny, and I don't know what we're doing with you and your lackluster sales. I guess it's not going to happen, right? So, so I, can be, I can be like bummed or frustrated or, or discouraged or whatever else, but he's not even going to ask me about it. You know what he's going to ask me? Were you faithful 
with what I gave you? And were you obedient with what I asked of you? And, and I'm going to have to come and just say, God, th this book is actually just a gift to you. Uh, th this, this book is a gift where, I, God, I, 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 I did my best to be faithful with the message you gave me to serve your body. And I did my best to be obedient in what you were asking of me. That's it. And he's going to say, well, well done. Well done. It's not connected to, it's not connected to anything else. We, we, we somehow have connected success to what, to what God does rather than what we... What I mean by that is we need to remember that, that we, we plant, we water, but he's the one that gives increase. So he's going to come to us. He's not going to say, where's that name? What, 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 how? He's, he's going to say, did you plant? Were you faithful to water? Because we, if we don't define success properly... We have so much activity going on that's going nowhere. It doesn't actually... Uh, one of the reasons why we have such a hard time defining success is because we... We are not being honest about how driven by insecurity we are. One of the reasons why we're having such a hard time defining success is because we have somehow, as a culture, just like given insecurity a pass because it gets results. We don't actually stop long enough to go, what's motivating me? Am I being motivated by a need for significance? Or am I being motivated by a passion for faithfulness and obedience? See, we're not, all, we're not honest enough because if your emotions are connected, I'll just use a, a, as a pastor Sunday numbers. If my emotions are connected to a number on Sunday, listen, I have a passion for souls. I want to see my city saved. But here's the reality. If my emotions are connected to a number on Sunday, if I'm really honest, it's not because of my passion for souls. It's, it's not. It's because I want to be accepted. And I don't want to be accepted. Like, and I'm not even talking about, I'm not even, uh, I, don't, I want people to be impressed. And I'm not talking about my church. My church loves me. Well, the ones that stayed. Uh, um, <laughs> they, they still love me. But, but the, like they, you know, they go to their service, Right? They go to their one, they go to their nine o'clock service and they've got their people. They're not, I, mean, I guarantee you, your people are not going, hey, did you hear our church has eight services? Is that amazing? That's incredible. We have eight services. I don't know how many you have, but we, that's pastors that use that talk. <laughs> are you understanding that? Like your people don't care if you have four services, five services. They just they show up to their service, they love you, they love their community, like, right? So it's not the it's not my people I'm trying to impress. It's other leaders. I want other leaders to be impressed because I want to be accepted by other leaders. And whether that's on social media or whether that's whenever they ask me what's going on or whatever they ask, like that's actually what's connected to the, the emotions for a number on Sunday. Because Jesus isn't going to ask me about the number on Sunday. Do you hear me on this? He's not going to ask you about that. He's going to ask you, were you faithful and were you obedient? And if I'm connected to something that he's not even going to ask me about, we need to stop long enough to go. It's because I have insecurity in my life. And you know what insecurity is? Insecurity is I need something other than Jesus. Here's why. I'm going to talk about it. But insecurity is so dangerous because it pushes you to short-term fruit. If you don't deal with insecurity in your life, it will push you to short-term fruit because you need something right now to feel secure and good. You need something right now. I'm convinced that the most significant things are done in secret that you can never post on Instagram. I'm convinced that what God applauds the most, nobody else even sees. But if you're dealing with insecurity, that's not enough. Insecurity is... I need Jesus plus something else. 
This is insecurity. I'm looking for security in something other than just Jesus. So we say, oh, he's enough. We sing songs. He's enough. You're all I need. All I need is Jesus. And a certain amount of book sales. All I need is Jesus. And a certain amount of followers. All I need is Jesus. And people to accept me. Like, it's, it's Jesus plus something else to make me feel secure. That's insecurity. And if I don't deal with that, it pushes me to things that are short-term based, not long-term based. When he's enough, like when Jesus is enough, I just think, Jesus, I don't need any, I don't, I don't need the approval of other people to be secure. I just, I just, man, we begin to act like Jesus owes us something. We get frustrated because our dream isn't happening. I'm like, Jesus, I don't need my dream. I just need you. I'm not in pursuit of a dream. I'm in pursuit of you. I'm like, you're enough. We begin to act like Jesus owes us our destiny. He owes us our prophetic words. He owes us whatever else. But we want those because we'll feel better about ourselves. This is also, I, I tell you right now, this is where comparison begins to come in because when I'm insecure, when I'm driven by a need for significance rather than a need for faithfulness and obedience, then I begin to compare my life to others. I begin to find people I believe are doing significant things, looking at their life on Instagram and comparing them to my life. And I begin to act like their assignment is greater than my assignment. I, I just want to tell you this, that I, I, we are applauding things and are impressed by things that Jesus isn't applauding or impressed by. This is, I mean, this is maybe an American example, so again, you'll have to filter for the next few days all of my Americanism, but, but I remember there's a guy named Rich Wilkerson Jr. who in America who is a pastor and a popular preacher and a great guy, a good friend. I, like, I, I love him. He's doing a phenomenal work. But, but the Lord's really opened the door to, um, to like celebrities, Hollywood, athletes, designers, really opened the world, that world to him. And it started with Kanye West. Kanye West kind of started going to his church. And I remember, this is a few years ago, that on Twitter, Kanye mentioned Rich in an interview and all of a sudden all of these like leaders christian leaders on Insta on twitter started retweeting this interview and i'm paraphrasing but they were like this is incredible kanye mentioned rich this is amazing and 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 i just sat there and thought what is going on not that rich not that rich is able to come alongside and influence these guys but that we are so impressed by this when did we start thinking that next level leadership is mentoring celebrities? <laughs> like, when did this begin to happen? When did we start becoming so impressed by people that have massive churches? And they're like, when did this happen? Like, as if, as if God, I'm going to stand before God one day. Rocky's going to stand before God one day. And God's going to be like, Rocky, how many celebrities do you disciple? None? Well, you know, God, I, there's a guy that did a local car commercial. Yeah, that doesn't count. <laughs> Do you know that Rich? Rich, Rich? Rich was discipling Kanye. That's right, Kanye. <laughs> As if that's more impressive than the missionary in India who's sitting with lepers that's ne never had a Twitter account in his life. <laughs> I, I, like, this is the silliness of it but it's because we haven't defined success properly. <laughs> success is just flat out faithful. Here's what success is. I just want to be a son that moves the heart of God. <laughs> remember years ago, I, 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 I remember years ago that uh, um, <clears throat> I was probably 25, 26, 27, and uh, we were doing youth conferences 
and I and I I, I was I hadn't I didn't speak at our youth conference for years, and I started to speak like in the morning session. And Judas Smith came. He was an associate youth pastor at the time. And uh, but he was you could tell he was an up and coming kind of speaker, and he was phenomenal. He spoke Friday night. It was so good. I was just like. It was just convicting and funny and revelatory and like unbelievable communicator. And uh, and then the next morning I was on and as a, you'll get this as a preacher, but there's sometimes as a preacher when like you feel confident about your word and then there's sometimes where you don't feel confident. It was one of those mornings I just did not feel confident about this word. And I remember I was sitting on the front row, and I was just sitting on the front row and I I, I was sitting there with like my um. Just on the front with my, you know, my, my, face, my hands on my face. And I was like, oh, God. And, you know, the whole place is like, oh, man, he's just interceding for a generation. <laughs> he's just interceding for a generation to encounter the word of God. And I'm just like, oh, God. And all I was praying was this, please don't let me suck. It's like, please don't let me suck in front of Judah. Like, this is all I was like, I don't want, please don't let me suck in front of Judah, God. And I remember sitting there, and as I was sitting there, the Lord spoke something to me today, 20 years later, that just, I mean, it just really marked me. The Lord said, Banning, you have a choice. He said, you can be a son. He said, you can be a preacher, or you can be a son. He said, if you choose to be a preacher, you'll be good sometimes. Other times, you won't be that good. He said, if you choose to be a son, you'll be great all the time, because you are an amazing son. And I just said... I just said, God, can I, can I be a preacher today? No, I didn't say that. I, I, I just said, God, I want to be a son. And, 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 I, and I realized this, that I just want to be a son that figures out what pleases his heart. This, here's success, faithfulness and obedience. As a son or daughter, go do what moves the heart of God. And, and I almost promise you, it's not what everybody else applauds. I, I think we should. I think we should create a culture where we just start applauding what God's applauding. Where we're like, yeah, I'd like to welcome him on stage. This guy's been married for 40 years, <laughs> has raised amazing kids, has been pastor in that church and that small community, has been faithful for them. Like, you, you know, like, I think we need to begin to actually just applaud people who are doing their assignment. Like, you're doing your assignment, and that's impressive to me. The fact that you're doing your assignment is impressive to me. But I, I remember we were doing um, church. When we started our church, I mean, we moved just a few hours away from Bethel, like came with like seven famous worship leaders. And so, I mean, the church grew pretty quick, and, and uh, we were at three services at this theater, and and it was one of those Sundays, it was just a good Sunday. You know those Sundays where you're just like, the message was on point, everything worked, the worship was great, services were full. And in between one of the services, I was out in like this breezeway and um, just saying hi to people and greeting them. And this lady walked by, I hadn't met her yet, she's maybe late 40s. I just said, hey, how you doing? I'm banning it, we haven't met yet and we're talking. And she immediately was like very like apologetic and um, and sheepish and she just said hey I, i'm kind of new here i've been coming for the last few months and we have a we have like a, a, a intro to the church course called elements and she said I, I i've i've only been to the first part of elements i haven't gone back and she says i have social anxiety it's pretty hard for me to be around people she says i've been coming on sunday though and she was like apologetic about it and i just stopped her and i just said oh don't even worry about elements that's amazing you're coming right now good for you kind of shared my wife's dealt with some anxiety and so just kind of connected just just loved on her for a little bit made sure she knew like you're doing awesome well done like don't worry about all this other stuff i took her back to this room where we have our volunteers and introduced her to some leaders so we go through the we go through the sunday and i'm driving home that sunday and uh i'm driving home that sunday and I kind of just, I, you know, as I'm driving home, I just turn my heart to the Lord, just kind of connect with him. And he begins to speak to me. You know what he talks to me about? He, he did not talk to me about all the people that came. He didn't talk to me about my message, and it was good. <laughs> he didn't talk to me about the amazing transitions. <laughs> he did. 
only, only church people know what I'm talking about. He, he didn't talk to me about any of that stuff. You know what he began to talk to me about? He just said, Manny, thanks for loving on that lady today. He just, he just said, thanks for taking time today just to see her and make sure you, thanks for loving on her and just making sure that she knows that she's all right. And all he talked to me about was the lady that I talked to. I didn't post that on Instagram. I wasn't like, guys, come here. I'm loving on this lady. Come get a picture real quick. Post it. She's got social anxiety. I'm totally, this is all, I'm, I'm really loving on her for a moment. Outside of me telling you right now, nobody would know. And yet it's what moves the heart of God. And I, I just think there's so many things that we're so impressed by. We applaud, and, and I, I think the Lord's like, I don't, I'm not impressed by any of that. I'm impressed by your obedience. I'm impressed by your faithfulness. I'm going to end with this story, and then we'll just, I just want to pray for you. But 2011, the Lord had called us to go to our kind of first, we had been doing conferences everywhere, but it was our first kind of big arena gathering. And we go to Chicago, had 14,000 people come. It was this amazing time. It was, it was, you know, really powerful. And the Lord just said, after this was done in 2011, the Lord just said, I want you to, to, to go again. So I said, all, all right, Lord. And so we believed God again, and we went and got an arena in New York City, and we got a, a massive theater in L.A., and we were going to do two events uh, that next summer. And so we began to mobilize for them, and... and uh, um, and, and, I, and I began, it was the most stress I'd ever experienced in ministry. It was the hardest. Our team was beginning to implode. It was just putting a ton of pressure. I realized that we were about to lose a ton of money because numbers were not coming in like I thought they would. We had a 13,000 seater in New York City, a, a, a theater held 7,000 in LA, but it, but it was super expensive. We were gonna go to Brazil right before that. And uh, um, we were going, and I just knew the numbers are not lining up. I mean, in one summer, uh, we lost $600,000, which, I mean, I'm glad I wasn't in New Zealand. That would have been a million dollars, you know. But, but we, 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 I knew, like, we went, we had 5,000 come, but we had a 13,000-seater, and it was empty and all this type of stuff. And as we were leading up to that, it was the most stress I'd ever experienced. It was just, I, I was, I don't want to be dramatic, but I was overwhelmed. I would just stand in the shower at night crying. I was so overwhelmed by what we were going after and this wasn't working like I thought. We were gonna lose a bunch of money and, and it, our team was having a hard time. And, and I remember we were on tour one night and I was just in a hotel, I was in the shower, fully clothed so you get the picture. I was in a wetsuit. I was in a wetsuit in the shower. And uh, just, that's, the, that's the picture I want you to have. Um, but I, I, was, I was in the shower one night, so overwhelmed so overwhelmed by, by what we were trying to do. And I don't even know if I have a theology of this. I, I don't even know I can tell you a Bible verse for this. But the Lord came to me and he just said, he just said, Vanning, thank you. He said, thank you for believing me for a generation. He said, thank you for taking a risk and stepping out. Thank you for doing something that maybe others wouldn't. And I just sat in that shower where we were about to go lose a ton of money. We were about to have, a, 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 you know, a half empty arena. We, we like, it's right after we, like, I, I was, it was going to be embarrassing. And yet the Lord came to me and he just said, thank you. He just said, thank you for, thank you for stepping out and having faith. Thanks for believing for a generation. And, and I just thought, I just want to be a son that moves the heart of God. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't care. I, I don't know what other measurements we have for success. I, like, I don't know what other metrics we're trying to use. But when arena's not full and when you lose a bunch of money and, it's, and, and God just comes and says, son, you, just, you move my heart. Thank you for your obedience. I just think, I, there's nothing. What else are we looking for? Like what, else, what else do we need? And when 
I stand before him one day, he's not going to be like, hey, why was that whole top of the arena empty? He's just going to say, man, I just love your heart as a son that was believing me for something and went out and didn't work out like you thought. But, man, I just I love you. We, we've got to define success. And if we don't, my concern is, is that we're going to get to the end of our lives and look back and say, I was busy. I'm not sure I ever crossed the finish line. I'm not sure I ever hit the mark. I didn't even know what the mark was. The mark is this, faithfulness and obedience. That's it. And I want us to not just go after it, but I want us to begin to celebrate that in others. Man, I just wish that we'd begin to look at other people and say, man, I've seen Man, I, the faithfulness and obedience that's in your life is so impressive. Well done. Well done, pastor in that church. Well done taking that person out day after day, believing God for them. Well done discipling that person that nobody even knows. Well done showing up. Like, like, can we celebrate what he celebrates? I want you to stand up with me. we just take just a moment with the Lord God we want to be leaders we want to be pastors that have defined success correctly God for every person in here that's somehow been running at something other than faithfulness and obedience or somehow faithfulness and obedience hasn't been enough Lord we just say tonight we want to be sons we want to be daughters who move your heart. God, we recognize the most significant things that are done in the kingdom are done in secret. Nobody will even know about them. We'll never get accolades from people about them, but they move your heart. God, I'm asking that you would deal with the insecurity, that we would be honest enough to say, Jesus, I need something other than you to find my identity and tonight we just say this Jesus I need nothing but you to be secure in my identity I, I, I don't need anything else Jesus but you you are enough for me Jesus you're enough for me and all we want to do is we want to be faithful and obedient with what you're asking of us May we be leaders that define success no other way but that. We just say you're enough, Jesus. You looking at us and saying well done is enough for us. God, may we position our lives to build for eternity. We want eternal fruit, God. That is what we are after. We don't, we don't care if anybody knows us on the earth. We did, I, I used to make this. I don't care if anybody knows me on the earth, God. I want to know that you are moved by my obedience. I know it's the first night and some of you are jet lagged, but can you just take just a minute longer? Just turn your heart to the Lord. Pastor Sam is somewhere around here. That we love you, Jesus. Oh, we love you, Jesus. God, shift our hearts. We want to applaud what you're applauding. We want to be impressed by what you're impressed by. I feel like so many of you in this room, if you, Jesus actually wants to come to you, and say the same thing. I just, I just see the Lord moving in this room and just saying thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness and thank you for your obedience. Say, people may not have seen it. The world may not have seen it. You may have not gotten the accolades that other people have gotten, but I see it and it's moved my heart. And I'm so pleased. 
feel like you just need the Lord to come grab you in the face and just look you in the eye and just tell you this. I feel like he wants to do this. He's just... He's impressed by you. People may not be. But that's okay. He's impressed by you. 